Hello everyone, my name is Bata Kenik. I am from Vika Foundation from Poland and this is um, the Women in Science series which I realized together with Girls in Tech uh, Poland and uh, today I have a huge pleasure and honor to talk to Professor Dame uh, Athene Donald, a physicist, Professor of Experimental Physics at the University of Cambridge. Professor Donald's uh, major uh, field of study is soft matter and biological physics. Uh, apart from research and academic work, Professor Donald is a champion of women in science. From uh, 2010 till 2014, she was the University of Cambridge's first gender equality champion. She has also worked uh, for a number of other initiatives and organizations that deal with advancing the career progression and representation of women in science and technology. Professor Donald uh, regularly writes and talks on this topic, both in the mainstream media and on her personal blog. Of course, these are the things we are going to talk about uh, during the interview. But first of all, I would like to say uh, good morning, Professor Donald. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Good morning. Um, my First question is about uh, your um, uh, research areas. I have already mentioned that it's soft matter physics and <clears throat> that you are an accomplished uh, researcher in the field of biological physics. So first of all, let me ask, um, what is soft matter and what is the connection between soft matter physics and biology? Okay, <clears throat> so soft matter is very familiar to everyone because it's a sort of soft squidgy stuff in our everyday world and one can contrast it with hard matter things like metals uh, which are perhaps much more the the usual area of research for physicists but soft matter is an area that has grown in importance over uh, the last decades i would say so it's things like food or personal products, things that are squidgy that deform if you put a stress on them on timescales that we can observe in the everyday world. Typically, that um, their properties are quite temperature dependent. Uh, and so these are things which, or when I say temperature dependent, I mean temperature dependent at the temperatures of the everyday world. So we're not talking about extreme conditions of uh, absolute zero or you know, a furnace. We're, to, we're talking about things that we can see changes in in the everyday world. So over the years, I um, I started off working on polymers, that's plastics, really. Um, so that that was the first area in which I worked. And slowly, I started working on food, which uh, much food it is polymeric. It things like polysaccharides, starch, which I did a lot of work on. That is. Um, now, starch is, a, well, it's a mixture of polymers, actually. Um, and from there, I moved further and further into biology. So that, that's the um, trajectory, if you like. That's how I got from working on polymers, plastics, which are quite familiar, into these areas that are less familiar or were less familiar to uh, physicists. I mean, it's quite interesting. When I started working on food, which was back in the, I guess, in the 1980s, so a long time ago now, it was regarded as, uh, you know, what are physicists doing working with something as complicated as that? And now uh, complex matter is itself a sort of domain of physics. And the idea of working on something that's complicated is fine. It doesn't have to be single crystals of copper anymore. Um, but the idea of going into biology itself, again, physicists said, oh, that's terribly complicated. But now um, biological physics has really taken off this idea that you can use the the tools and approaches and theoretical ideas from physics to work with much more complicated um, matters, um, much more complicated than I ever got into, certainly. Yes, and one of the most um, popular um, experiments, the one that we can very easily conduct uh, at home and children particularly love, is uh, making a non-Newtonian liquid uh, with the use of just water and starch, which you have already mentioned. And so um, I'm sure a lot of parents love to do this experiment, but I'm not so sure if they could explain uh, really what uh, is characteristic about non-Newtonian liquids. So I'm asking you, what's characteristic about non-Newtonian liquids and where can we find them? 
Okay, so a Newtonian fluid is something like water, where um, the more force you put on it, the more pressure you put on it to move it, the faster it moves. And there's a simple linear relationship between the, the stress and the strain rate. So that, that's the, the pressure versus how fast the fluid moves. And um, in that case, the, the relationship between the two is a simple number, which is known as the viscosity. If you have a non-Newtonian fluid, then that number itself depends on how hard you're pushing. So it could be uh, that it gets harder and harder. The, the more you try to move it, the harder it gets and it kind of locks up, which is what happens with the starch in water. Um, or it could be that the more you push, the easier it gets. And an example of that would be non-drip paints. So if you have um, a non-drip paint, you know, it sits perfectly still on its own in the, the tin. Um, and um, when you uh, dip your paintbrush in it and pick the paintbrush up, it doesn't drip off because there's not much force in it. But if you put it, you know, paint the ceiling or something, it it will flow perfectly easily. So th you're using the non-Newtonian nature there to get a product that gives you what you want. Uh, and um, as far as I know, um, liquid crystals, which I'm sure everybody has heard of, are also a uh, soft matter and examples of liquid crystals can be uh, found both in the natural world and of course in technological applications. Uh, well, I personally, the first thing that comes to mind uh, when I think uh, liquid crystals uh, is a smartphone, for example. So, uh, so yes, what are liquid crystals? Please tell, tell us and what are the examples? Okay, liquid crystals uh, are molecules which are by their shape anisotropic. So I always take the example, and I haven't particularly prepared for this, but I should have done. Um, if you if you take a pen or a pencil or something, it's anisotropic. It's long and thin. And if you have a, a group of these in um, dispersed in a fluid, then at low concentrations they can orient in any particular direction. But if you push them together, if you have a high packing density, they have to align. And that's one of the key properties of liquid crystals, that they, they adopt anisotropic macroscopic structures because they are anisotropic at the molecular level. So they are, um, they don't have to be rod-like, lots of molecules are, um, but they can be disks and they will stack in the same way. But, but if you have something where the molecules are all lined up, then their optical properties are very different according to how you illuminate them, which, you know, if you have polarized light, it will look very different along or across the, the orientation. Mm -hmm. and, and this means that if you, for instance, we're talking through a, a computer screen and that will almost certainly be based on liquid crystal technology. It's, um, they often have uh, electric dipoles or magnetic dipoles, and therefore if you switch an electric field on or off, you can change the direction of orientation, um, and that will change how the light interacts. Now, there are many, many components in making a successful smartphone screen, uh, TV screen, whatever, but that's the basic thing. They are um, anisotropic molecules. Um, and, I mean, they're, they're an interesting story because they were first discovered because of their optical properties back in the 1880s, and no one thought they were anything other than a, a sort of peculiar curiosity. And it took 70 odd years before they started, people appreciated what they could be used for. Uh, if we look at biological molecules, cholesterol is one. Um, so what clogs up our arteries? And in that case, I mean, it's, um, it's not really a rod, it's, it's more a planar molecule. Um, but it's what's called chiral, which means it, it's right and left look different. And that imposes an inherent twist on the way the molecules pack. So the orientation, instead of having all the molecules lined up in one direction over a large distance, they systematically twist in a helix. And that's known as a cholesteric or a twisted pneumatic phase. If one goes to... Um, 
polymers, uh, natural polymers. Um, so something like DNA is a very long, stiff molecule. So it has, again, anisot anisotropicity, I can't say. It's anisotropic. And um, again, if you put DNA in a solution in water, it will align and will, you'll get these pretty optical patterns. How relevant that is biologically is not clear. I mean, it is a long, stiff molecule. Does that matter when it comes to biological function? Maybe not clear. But for instance, in sperm, where you're really trying to put pack molecules very close together, they will all align because of their shape. So you can get very high packing density. Mm -hmm. But molecules like um, DNA are liquid crystalline too under certain circumstances. In your research, you um, use a range of um, uh, research methods, research uh, techniques. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Because it's, uh, it, it's truly fascinating. So in the case of liquid crystals, I did quite a lot of work on um, liquid crystalline polymers, uh, most of which, uh, the, the synthetic ones, not the biological one, ones, the synthetic ones have not particularly turned into anything useful. Um, the one exception, although I didn't do much work on it, is Kevlar. I should have mentioned this. Kevlar is the basis of bulletproof vests, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly tough material. Um, but you process it in hot concentrated sulfuric acid, which is not a nice processing read. Um, sorry, that's that's by the by, that's really the answer to the previous question. But um, I've used a lot of microscopy of different kinds. I mentioned polarized light. So I've done a lot of work with polarized light microscopy, um, mm -hmm. which if you have uh, um, structures which are anisotropic, so they interact differently with uh, right and left polarized light, you get very you get very pretty pictures, actually, but, but they tell you about the way the molecules pack. I've also done a lot of electron microscopy. And uh, this is, uh, well, compared with traditional microscopes, optical microscopes, and, and certainly the kind you might find in a school lab or something, uh, electron microscopes are much higher resolution, which means you can look at much higher magnification. Um, so uh, transmission electron microscope, you can get down now, not, not when I was um, active, you can get down to the atomic level and you are shining the electron beam through very thin samples. Scanning electron microscope, you are looking at the electrons that are reflected off the surface of a, um, of a sample. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with the development of a technique known as environmental scanning electron microscope, microscopy, which allowed you to uh, look at samples that were hydrated because electron microscopes typically work under high vacuum. So that if you have water present in a biological sample, for instance, the water will just sublime off. But if you, if you have um, a way of having the electrons, they will have to be produced in high vacuum because they get scattered off gas molecules. But the, the reason I'm pointing up here is typically the, the electron source is up here and it will come down a, a column. Um, and in the environmental scanning electron microscope, down that column, the pressure slowly goes up. Um, so you have different regions with different pressures. And it means that around the sample, if you have a very small chamber around the sample, you can keep fully hydrated. You, you have saturated water vapor around the sample. So you can actually look at a biological sample, for instance, um, at that pretty high resolution but without dehydrating it and without having to do complicated sample preparation. So one of the things we did more as a proof of concept than because it taught us anything new was looking at how leaves respire so that you could watch the, the so-called stomata of the leaves opening and shutting as you change the, the water pressure around them. Um, and, and it showed that you could look at dynamic processes in this way. Fascinating. Mm, let me change the subject now. Uh, because I mentioned in the introduction that apart from research and academic uh, work, you are active in initiatives uh, that work to advance uh, women's careers in science and technology. And you also write and talk a lot about women uh, in science, also from the historical uh, perspective in your public appearances. So um, I would like to ask you, do you think there is still a lot to do uh, to overcome stereotypes uh, which are still present 
uh, concerning um, women scientists, women doing science? I, I absolutely do think there's a lot to do. And I can only talk in detail about the, well, really the English system of education. So in England, you make quite substantial choices about the subjects you will study at 16 at about age 14. So you, you are going into choosing, do you do physics? Really quite young and at, at a time when you're going through adolescence and it, 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 you're very influenced by what society thinks about you. And I think this is very detrimental for girls going into physics. Now, if you look at biology, um, in this country, lots and lots of girls study biology, probably more girls than boys. But in physics, in engineering, that absolutely isn't the case. When I was uh, at school and going to university, maybe 10% of the undergraduate class was women in physics. Now in, in Cambridge, it's 20, 20 to 25%. It's still completely imbalanced. And I think this is because right from the earliest years, there is this stereotyping that, that girls don't want to be engineers, that doing things with your hands is what girls do. If you think about the toys that, that children are given, typically it's the boys will be given the chemistry set or the, the Meccano or you know construction toys and, and the girls will be given more passive things. And I think this has a real impact, but it's also the messaging, the messaging in society that it's somehow odd for a girl to want to 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 study um computing is another subject which is massively male dominated and you know we're losing so much of the talent by driving them out so i think there is a huge amount to do and it is societal um which does imply it might be parents it might be teachers i certainly think the media have a role to play in trying to counter this image of if you are a girl doing engineering or physics you are somehow odd you're a geek you're you're unnatural you know what you really should want to be as a footballer's wife and you know it's just really damaging i think that 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 message is received by a lot of children at an age where it really impacts on them and uh, how did you become interested in physics? Was there anyone who inspired you in particular? Was there any particular influence? Not really. I mean, I did have good teaching, um, and I think that's very important. Uh, but I just, you know, I, I, I was introduced to physics when I was about 13. We, we you know, we were, we were taught physics and chemistry separately. And I just really liked it. I mean, it was as simple as that. It, it, uh, people often ask me why. And, and I think it's because to me, it made sense of the world. I mean, some people want to, to study the living world. But for me, it was much more how things were organized, how things, <coughs> excuse me, how things um, worked. Um, and it's, that's not because I like taking things to pieces. I wasn't the kind of child who was constantly um, you know, taking their watch to pieces or something. It, that wasn't me. But it still, it, it was the, the rational way you could explain things, you could predict things. That, that's what I really liked. But having a good teacher is very important. And again, if I look at education in this country, um, f there, are, there is a great deficit of qualified physics teaching and often physics is taught by people who haven't got physics degrees which I think makes it really hard for them I mean it's nothing to do with how smart they are it is simply that they're not that comfortable if they've got a biology degree um, and they are expected to teach physics it can be quite tough mm, so for dessert let me ask you why do you think girls and young women should study science should be encouraged to study science because we need their, their input, we need their brains. And there's a lot of evidence that if you have a diverse research group, just as if you have a diverse uh, board for a company, you make better decisions, you are more innovative because people are approaching any given problem, whatever it may be, from different directions. Now, that's not to say there's a woman's way of doing science. It just means that the more diversity you have, the more diverse insights you will have and so we need those people and goodness knows there are enough really large problems be it climate change or um, food security 
or the energy transition, whatever. You know, there are so many massive challenges and we need as much imagination, as much different ways of thinking about things as possible. And also, I mean, that's the sort of very practical aspect of it. That's what would that do for society? But this is a very simple and important moral case. Why should half the population be deterred from doing a subject if that's what they want to do? And, you know, you can argue which should have more weight. Well, they go hand in hand. We don't have to choose between them. They both say keeping a subject like physics open to girls just as much as boys, that's really um, important. And I would say I think there is the same stereotyping against certain subjects um, that boys come up against. Mm -hmm. So, again, if I look at this country, I think boys are deterred. You know, Cambridge University, 80 percent of our undergraduate vets are women because somehow boys, men do not think that's a subject or, or career that's for them. Um, and English, studying English at university, English literature typically, again, there are more women than men. So that there are men being put off. And, and I think, you know, it's there's a lot of conversation about why should girls do physics, but there's less about why should boys do biology. And I think, or, or psychology is another subject. So I think, you know, we need to make sure that we keep all options open to everyone so that they can choose the subjects that are right for them. Yes, exactly. Obviously, there is still so much to do. And um, people have been talking about this for so many years, for decades. But uh, these stereotypes are still there, you might think. Perhaps they are not there anymore, but they are still there. They are still right? there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see, I think there's a lot of work being done with interventions in schools, which is fine in the classroom. But if you're still getting all these messages from the media, you know, the things you read in the newspapers, whatever, social media, um, they're still going to act as a deterrent. And so it's a societal challenge, not just something that the teachers can readily improve. And, and one of the things that I find very sad, again, in this country, and I don't know how true it is elsewhere, is that there's a sort of pitting of arts against science. And, you know, I think because many journalists have an arts degree, they will, you know, maybe have studied English at university or something mm -hmm. like that, that they, they almost don't want science to thrive in a way you know they, they see it as um if science wins the art subjects lose and i feel no we need both and social science you know we need the whole lot to to make sense of our world social science is perhaps more than ever now and of course we need people in general uh, to understand how the world works how the universe works um, absolutely i mean a lot as i say a lot of the big societal challenges of science at their core and we need politicians who understand these things because otherwise they're making decisions based on imperfect knowledge yes exactly mm, professor donald thank you so much it's been a pleasure talking with you thank you once again for joining me today for sharing some of your knowledge uh, and uh, your um, views with me. Thank you. Thank you so much.